I'm uh, Evelyn Lewis. Um, I'm Dutch but working in the UK by now. I've been involved in monitoring police and intelligence since uh, since the 80s. I was an active squatter in Amsterdam back in the days. What I will talk about briefly is our work as the undercover research group and I will talk a bit about um, the, uh, the Pitchford inquiry. Um, well, as you all know, uh, it started with the brand of the undercover uh, policing scandal, the exposure of Mark Kennedy. Since 50 more undercovers have been exposed, each of them lived the life of an activist for about five years. And the SDS, the Special Demonstration Squad and the various names they operated under since, have been doing this since 1968, since the establishment was afraid that the anti-Vietnam War demonstration would get violent or would mean revolution or whatever. Um, we all know about the use of the birth certificates of, dead, of children who died young, the long-term relationships. What did that get us? Eventually, uh, the undercover policing inquiry. How did we get there? Uh, what I think is crucial, what is very clear this afternoon, is that the undercovers were exposed by the people who were targeted. It started with uh, women who went looking for the, the, the lovers that disappeared, because after the five years, the undercovers would always disappear. Mark Kennedy was exposed by uh, um, a woman who he had a relationship with who found the power to sort of start an investigation with friends after they no, no longer trusted him anymore. All the stories came into the public domain with the help of journalists, mainly by, by The Guardian, Rob Evans and Paul Lewis, who did write a book. A whistleblower that eventually came forward. That all, all, all these exposures, all these scandals, led to about a dozen internal police inquiries. Most of them remained secret. Uh, but the pressure kept building up again and again, new stories would come out and eventually one of those reviews, the Ellison Review, confirmed that Doreen and Neville Lawrence, the parents of uh, Stephen Lawrence, had been spied upon by this same unit uh, during their campaign for justice about the murder of their son Stephen Lawrence. What we do, the undercover research group, we are a sort of a small network of people um, who were involved in those first, first exposures. We still investigate people who have uh, the suspicions of people who, who come to us, but of course our work is based on the work that has been done before by, by people like Helen and Alison, who did not know something like this existed. Now we know, so that is an entirely different story. What we also want to do, we do not only investigate suspicions, but we do want to map out the broader network behind the undercovers, the undercover officers, the people who were responsible for that, the people who, who supervised these units and, and further down the road, the people who, um, well, who said this was okay. I will tell you a little bit uh, about how we investigate undercovers, how we, how people that come to us with their suspicions, uh, how we, t how we, how we work with them. What I think is very important is that all the, the stories that are coming out now could create a lot of paranoia, paranoia, and a lot of fears and a lot of negative have negative effects on activism. We think it's very important that if there are suspicions, you do a proper investigation and you do it fast and you do it with a small group, never go pointing fingers at people or spread rumors because then sort of you're doing the work that they, the police uh, would like to do. It can be very destructive. We kind of developed a method based on the research <coughs> experience of, of the first 15 cases. Um, we 
sort of analyzed the, uh, the trade craft of the undercovers and we, we summarized them in, in 15 questions, 15 questions that you can start with. If you, if you have suspicions that someone in your group is or has been an undercover, if you check all the boxes of our questions, that doesn't mean that you have an undercover. It means that a further investigation is necessary. I can tell you a bit about our investigation into Carlo Neri, who we exposed uh, earlier this year in January. People of the Socialist parties of our anti-racist groups came to us. They, after Mark Kennedy was exposed, others were exposed, they sort of recognized the pattern and thought those 15, after we published the 15 questions, they, they really thought like, we might have a case here. So what we did, we talked to about 20 people who had known Colonieri, who worked with him. He had several relationships in the five years that he was undercover. Uh, people he lived with, people he, he rented houses off. What we are looking for when we talked, when we talked to all those people is to have a sort of better answers to those 15 questions. If he fits the framework that we, we've built, which is not, of course, a fit structure, there's always exceptions, there's, there's differences. We want to know the role the undercover played, his profile, the positions he had, but also we want to be very curious for official details, records, uh, the addresses he was registered, uh, the names of family members, photographs. Why do we want to? We want that because one of the things is, is we try to locate someone. He disappears, and we we kind of want to disprove that someone was an undercover. So if you know, there's all kind of reasons why people are active for several years and then they move on with their life. They get married or they move or whatever. So if we are able to, which which, which we have had for several times as well. If we are able to find someone and see that he lives alive, we can, we kind of, we can disprove there is, someone is an, uh, has been an undercover. Also, what we have learned um, is that most of the undercovers use details from their real life. They, Carla Nero, for instance, it was difficult to, to try and find him. We, we, we went a long way around. We even looked for uh, policemen, maybe now in another part of their career, with an Italian background, because he was called Carlo, he had an Italian background. Um, we even focused, zoomed in on, on someone who turned out to have a, a, a completely different role in the police, and we found someone who knew him uh, because he was he was investigating sex offenders and could disprove that he was our guy because he looked very different. So we found we only found him for the time that he was active. We knew he was active. <laughs> he was registered at several addresses, and he made a mistake because he registered under his real name uh, at the, at the address of his last partner because this guy really. He made even more of a mess of, of the lives he, he played with. He disappeared with the third partner he had while he was undercover. So he also left his wife. Apparently he needed an, an official address and he used her address. So then we had his, his, his last name, his real last name. And then we could, lo we could look up that family. It was a very special Italian name. Uh, he and we could we found out that he had used the name of his sister, even the name of his kid, the name uh, you know his father, his mother. He had used all their real names. With that, we could look up his official records. We found the birth certificates of his kids and his marriage certificate, which said that he was a police officer. And his second child was born while he was on the cover, so we knew he was a police officer while he was active with the Socialist Party. So then, to finish this up, uh, we discussed with the group involved how, you know, they of course want control over the story, how it goes out, what goes out, what doesn't go out. 
we had a splash in Newsnight and in The Guardian, which was good. We sort of gave the story to them. But then, of course, Newsnight didn't really acknowledge it. They said on their website, it said it was a joint investigation of The Guardian and Newsnight, which wasn't really the case. Um, well, this is, this is the way it works. We think it's very important to publish all the details. We've got a blog where we've explained how we found him out. We've got um, a sort of a portal of our own, a wiki website, where we ha have put his profile up. So the result in this case was two of his former partners were accepted by the public inquiry as core participants. Um, we think it's very important to continue to come with these kind of stories, to, to keep putting pressure on the inquiry because they, and I will come back later, we'll come back to that, they tend to sort of narrow the focus of, the, um, of, the, of their investigation and we want justice for all the people that have been spied upon. So, now we have the undercover police and inquiry, this is their official logo. Um, I've summarised the, the remits of the inquiry, I can't go into it too much detail, but what is very important, one thing is, that they want to focus on what the police, this, this specific units have done in, Eng in England and Wales. And uh, the, the English and Welsh police forces, this is a, a serious sort of limitation to the inquiry. Um, I won't go through all the, uh, all the other things, this, these are the, this is sort of a summary of the remits. Why we think it is important to include the actions of undercovers abroad is that we've got 15 undercovers now half of them worked abroad in 17 different countries over over 25 years the list you see here is just where mark kennedy went we've got a longer list at our website um, we've seen allison's holidays all over which you think they weren't operations but they it was being abroad so not including all the actions of the undercovers abroad uh, is a serious limitation. We know that Mark Kennedy and other undercovers went to the protest against the G8 in Heiligendamm. We also know that German undercovers came to the G8 in Stirling and with all the undercovers that were active at the time in the UK, uh, we have found out through questions uh, in the German Parliament that there is a, a coordination group of undercover activities at the EU level. Uh, in Scotland, Scotland is special of course because only a few years ago the, the, the organisations of the police have been split up. Uh, and we, we can see that the top uh, police officers they have over there come from the same pool of people who made a career in the UK and several of them have been implicated in, you know, having had a past as, um, as the head of special branch during the time that they had several known undercovers. So there is an... Um, there is a pressure now in Scotland to either have Scotland included in the Pitchford inquiry or uh, several members of parliament there want to have an inquiry into undercover policing of their own. What we have seen, what we think is a very serious limitation of the Pitchford inquiry, if you look at all the people who uh, applied for what they call core participancy to, to be accepted into the inquiry, if you look at the rulings, it's not, it's not sort of completely black and white, but there seems to be a preference for people who already have proof that they've been spied upon. So they, they have proof of in close involvement with, with undercovers. And we think this is kind of weird because the people who already have proof of having been spied upon, they know because of our, not the undercover researcher, but the activist investigations themselves. So it's without those investigations, without those, those exposures, there wouldn't have been an inquiry in the first place. So it's kind of weird to focus on the people who already have proof. Well, you could make a case that the people who have serious suspicions, those are the cases that should have to be investigated. So we are very afraid that this will 
limit the scope of the inquiry. Um, that's why, and um, as uh, I think Harriet mentioned it before, Helison mentioned it before, it's very important to that for the police or the inquiry to release the, na the cover names used by the undercover officers. That wouldn't, be, that wouldn't interfere with their privacy because it's their false names, but then we can go back and we can see if we, you know, th those names, have, where have, have they been active years ago? And if, then we could, th then you would get a better idea of the, of the scope of, of the infiltration over the years. There's also a list mentioned in one of the um, internal reviews, police reviews, or a list of groups that have been spied upon of more than 400 groups. That list should be made public as well, because then we can understand and we can investigate more, or and the inquiry can investigate more of who have sort of the scope of the entire operations. Um, this might be a bit too far, but further limitations. There's of course the, how everything has to be paid, how the how the legal support has to be paid. So the the inquiry decided to make up categories. I think Doreen and Neville Lawrence are a category of their own. <laughs> um, the categories are a bit weird, so what's the difference between social and environmental activist and political activist? If you, if you see that there's political organizations and polit politicians as well, it is a sort of a... We're a bit afraid that by throwing together too many groups and too many cases, uh, chances are that not everybody will be able to, to come up with their story. The most important limitation, and Harriet already <coughs> talked about it, this, we've had a hearing a few weeks ago about how much is going to be disclosed and how much is going to be held, behind, how much of the hearings are going to be held behind closed doors. The ruling on that is expected early May and we think that the success of the Pitchford Inquiry kind of depends on what the outcome of this is going to be. It could be if Pitchford, would, the police is sort of throwing the, the, the toys out, they want everything behind closed door. They even make it the case that um, if you have all the hearings behind closed doors and if you would have the end report, that you, if you would publish that, that would still be a public inquiry. Um, and this sort of, it follows the line that we've seen during the court case, during, you know, even when, when we expose Carlo Nier, we, we know he's a police officer, people, uh, the, uh, women have been accepted by the public inquiry, they still hold on to the, uh, neither confirm nor deny, we can't say whether he was a police officer, they will continue to do that. Um, so, I think it's very important to sort of continue to do research and to continue to come with these stories to put a pressure on the inquiry. It's not, if I say we, I talk about the undercover research group, but also we don't work alone. We see ourselves as, as a part of, of the campaign uh, opposing police surveillance. Uh, we work with, with, uh, with all these groups. Um, what we try to do, we, we try to do all kinds of things, not just expose undercovers, but we also we try to map out the broader <coughs> network. We've also set up another project, which is called the Special Branch Files Project. We invite the journalists to share the files that they that have been released under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, which, which, and we focus on the spying. So we have like uh, files on spying on the anti-apartheid movement. We have other stories as you can see and we've used, I, I'm very proud of this project. What you can see is that uh, we, we've put them on document cloud and you have sort of, you can make windows where you see parts of the real documents and when you click on them you get into the real 
document. It's very nice. Have a look at it. <laughs> well, this is this is one of the ways. One of the sort of we, we try and if picture is not going to work, we may set up our own. Well, we we all together. We may set up our own set of hearings. Uh, there's all kind of plans. I'm kind of rushing through this because we're running out of time. Meanwhile, support us. This is we're on Twitter. We've got our website. Um, and a bit of commercial. I've, I've written some books. They're here. They're for sale. That was my story. Thank you.